Good evening. My name is Annabelle Stelzer, and I'm a trustee of WITSO UK, Israel's largest independent social welfare organization. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you who have joined us this evening to what promises to be an interesting and engaging conversation between Stephen Pollard, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish Chronicle, and BBC correspondent, investigative journalist, and BAFTA-nominated documentary maker, John Ware. John and Stephen have history. John is a member of the consortium which owns the JC, and Stephen is responsible for nominating John for a WITSO Commitment Award in the category of Fair Reporting in the Media, for which John won the award in 2015. John subsequently joined the prize winner's trip to Israel and visited many WITSO projects across the country, seeing firsthand WITSO's life-changing work covering all sectors of society, irrespective of race, age, gender, or religion. Before I hand over to Stephen, I'd like to let you know where the essential proceeds raised from ticket sales and donations will go. Weepso is seeking to fund renovations to the Barzilai Medical Daycare Center in Ashkelon. Most of the children who attend the daycare center are from families whose parents work in the hospital. There are also some children attending who have been referred by social welfare services. Due to Ashkelon's geographical location and frequency of rocket alerts, the daycare center offers extended hours in times of high security situations and red alerts. The fact that parents employed in the hospital can continue to work and look after their patients while knowing that their children are well cared for is invaluable. Donations can be made by going to wheatsouk.org forward slash donate. Now I'd like to hand over to Stephen as I'm looking forward to hearing about John's long-standing association with the Jewish people and his equally long-standing connection with Israel. Over to you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have been asked to interview John this evening. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of as editor of the paper is that John is one of our uh, relatively regular contributors. He's a wonderful uh, writer, uh, filmmaker, and uh, it's an especially timely uh, night on which to interview John, given that last week his documentary for Panorama on labour and anti-Semitism was given a very justified BAFTA uh, award nomination. Uh, for which um, I certainly, and I'm sure everybody watching, uh, has a, a huge muzzle top to John for that. Anyway, let's let's start at the beginning and um, let's see, let's go right back and ask uh, John, um, what is it about um, Israel and Jews that, uh, you know, you're not Jewish? <laughs> um, wh where does the connection begin? Um, well, that's good. It, it begins really when I'm a teenager. Um, I was uh, watching the television news, um, the Six Day War. At that time, I was thinking seriously about going into the army. And I barely, I, I mean, I'd heard of Israel, but I, you know, beyond 
hearing the name Tel Aviv, I didn't really know much more than that. And um, as the war wore on, it was I was thinking to myself, who are these guys? Because, you know, uh, they were doing a remarkable job. They were the number of deployed troops were <clears throat> they were outnumbered roughly one to three. They were aircraft were one to three outnumbered. I think tanks the same reserve army five times as much. And yet they were holding the line and advancing. And I thought it was a remarkable victory, a remarkable victory. And it encouraged me to, to find out more about the history of the country itself. And that led you to go on kibbutz? Well, it, it, yes, it did, actually, a few years later. Partly what led me to go on the kibbutz was I couldn't think what I wanted to do with my, with my life. So, you know, like a lot of young men in their early 20s, I, I got an airplane to Israel. But uh, it was actually my, my six months on the kibbutz up in the north at uh, Malkia, near Kiryat Shimona that um, decided me, that uh, made me decide that I wanted to go to journalism. Why? Why? What was it? What was it that, that led to journalism from a kibbutz? Oh, uh, I just was because I, in the first place, I met lots of veterans from the Six Day War. There were there were the Six Day War was about three or four years old when I went there, and uh, I just listened to their stories and I found myself wanting to tell them and write about them. And um, in fact, I wrote an article, I think the first article I'd ever written for a magazine. Uh, and that, you know, one thing led to another. So what, so the, 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 the one thing leading to another, tell us about your early, your early years in well, your journalism. Where, well, how I, did you actually start? Uh, yes. I, it, well, I sort of wrote, you know, to about 40 newspapers and um, got 40 rejections. And um, eventually, uh, I got a, well, eventually, um, and I sort of went from the Times down, you know, and ended up with the Britain's oldest weekly newspaper, actually, in Droitwich. And they said, yes, come along. And then I spent, you know, whatever it was, a year or two uh, reporting everything that sort of won or something or won a prize or moved, you know. Um, and then went to the evening paper. And then I went to the Sun newspaper in Fleet Street, who sent me off to Belfast for three years. And was that where your, I mean, we'll come, we'll talk about Northern Ireland later, but that's where you had your first real taste of, of Northern Ireland and got you interested in the topic. Yeah, probably. absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, 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 frankly, I was quite pleased to leave after three years. There, were, there, were, there was just so much, you know, death and um, yeah. individual deaths, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't like a conventional war although in parts it was, but it was more, it was very personalised, you know, you, you, you sort of, you know, knew some people who, who, who were killed and, um, and, it was, and it was, you know, every day was the same and I was quite pleased to get out of it. Yeah, and you left uh, Fleet Street and went into what you're now really yes. best known for, um, filmmaking for, for TV. That's right, yes, I was, asked, I, was in, I was asked if I'd like to go and join the uh, what was then um, a sort of rival to Panorama on the ITV network, Granada's World in Action program. And I joined them as a researcher in uh, 1977, I think it was, um, and um, got paid a lot more money, which was very nice, and um, bought a flat. Um, uh, it was a completely different discipline. Um, you know, gone were daily deadlines. Um, this was long form journalism, yeah, which I liked. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, I've always been more of a sort of cross country runner than a sprinter. You know, and um, and I remember Brian Lapping asking me, "Well, what do you want to do? Uh, what story do you want to do?" Um, and I said, "Well, I want to find." I want to find uh, Joseph Mengele. And he said, come on, what, what do you actually want to do? I mean, come on, don't be silly. You can you find Joseph Mengele. I said, well, I probably won't, but I really want to. I really want to look for him because, you know, he's, he's um, 
no one's looking for him now and he's still alive and he's a dreadful individual and all of that anyway to cut a long story short uh brian in the end gave way and gave me a little bit of money to work up a proposal and the long and the short point is that in the end we 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 went down to south america we we, we spent six weeks there and we didn't find him <laughs> but it's but it's an amazing story though i mean we oh. uh, jc readers will have read uh, a few weeks ago you you did a two-part uh, story for us on on the the letters from his yeah. son that you were that you were given access to yeah um I mean, the whole story of trying to find him is a real old-fashioned Fleet Street caper in a way. Well, it, it? Well, it, we're, we're, Fleet Street, I don't think Fleet Street could have afforded it. Granada had a lot of money uh, those yeah. days, and they were tremendously generous. Uh, uh, you know, funding a whole crew down there for six weeks has cost a lot of money. But we, we did, we did, we did, we had a go. We, we, we got a, we hired a German female German doctor. The point was that we thought she would, she could infiltrate the. Um, settler german settler community in paraguay which is where we thought mengolo was and we did or she did well we directed her towards the right people but she in the end we immortalized a, you know we filmed a conversation with her talking to a friend of mengolo's and then it all got a bit tricky because he realized he that, that, that he became quite suspicious that's as far as we got but um some years later, I, I wrote the book, uh, the, the biography of Mengele, and we got hold of, we befriended Mengele's son, Rolf, who um, gave us, um, to his credit, uh, all of his correspondence with his father uh, while he was a fugitive and alive. And and you became effectively World in Action's Nazi correspondent. Um, I mean, you, you, you made three films, I think, is that right? To tell us about... Um, and one was Ivan the Terrible, and the other was um, uh, Colonel Ralph. Uh, so tell us about yeah, the, the Well, I did, yeah. I went to, you know, the, the early 80s, uh, it became clear that quite a lot of um, displaced persons from the Second World War had settled, some of them under false names in the United States. And um, uh, Demenyuk's name, Ivan Demenyuk's name came up, and we found him in... Um, I, I, he had been found, but we uh, hadn't talked to anybody. Uh, and uh, we, I tried to film him during his Sunday service in some Ukrainian church. His, his um, followers uh, chased me and uh, <laughs> started kicking, kicking me quite hard. Um, but fortunately, someone had um, alerted the Cleveland police who rescued me. I was very grateful to them. And then... Um, and then we looked at a guy called Archbishop Trefer, and we got some footage of him and a conversation with him as well. And then later, um, Trefer, I should say, was responsible for a pogrom in Bucharest in 1941. Uh, and then um, uh, a couple of years later, went down to Santiago, uh, where we found Walter Ralph, who had been, uh, it was an appointee of uh, Heydrich, I think, Reinhard Heydrich. And one of his tasks was to organize um, a fleet of um, lorries, which were converted into mobile gas chambers. Um, and uh, I, I spoke to Ralph, I, I mean, we, 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 spent, we spent 10 days outside his house trying to get a picture of him. I think we've got a picture to Show yeah. now. Okay. Do you want to tell us about this picture, John? Yeah, put it on the screen. I can't quite see it. Well, there's there's Ralph obviously in the right hand corner. In the top left is is the van we used. We we would turn up at his house every day, and um, the driver would get out with a bag of tools, uh, pretending to be a uh, a workman of some sort, and we spent me and George Jesse Turner who was the cameraman uh, we spent the whole day for 10 days in this blasted van <laughs> he never showed not one day did he come out and the money was running out the budget was we were way over budget and we gave it one last day and literally in the last hour of the last day 
these gates opened and out came Ralph taking his dog for a walk. And George and I were just, <laughs> you know, so excited. We literally tumbled out over each other. And um, anyway, uh, I got some footage of him. And I remember saying to Ralph, um, kind of Ralph, and he said, yeah. And I couldn't think what to say. I was so surprised. I said, look, you're, you're a very lucky man, aren't you? He said, yeah. He's a very lucky man still to be free. And when a lot of people who you killed aren't, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the film ran out. But at least we got the footage. And it was wow. it's quite a story. Yeah. Um, so then you left uh, World in Action and moved to Panorama. Um, and tell us, so let's, let's start. One of the films you were most uh, famous for initially was the uh, expose of Shirley Porter. Um, well, Shirley, so tell Shirley us about Besser that. Were, was, um, as some of you may remember, was, was a very high profile um, leader of Westminster City Council. Um, but um, she would, to this day, deny this, but unfortunately the evidence is against her that she used uh, what was called then ratepayers money to target at marginal ward <clears throat> you're not supposed to do that with taxpayers money you're not supposed to use taxpayers money for preeminently um uh electoral electoral purposes and um so we 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 we, we revealed all this and um shirley, shirley in the end was was surcharged 30 million pounds i don't think she's ever forgiven me but um, and um here we are I'm, I'm right in thinking that there's a there's a a, a family connection as it were well, there, that, there was it, uh, my, my mother-in-law lived in uh, Natonia for a bit uh, like a lot of Brits um, and um, uh, British British Jews, and um, I think she bumped into Shirley. Um, but I don't think they had a lot to say to a lot to say to each other. Um, there it is. It, it, look, the evidence I'm afraid was against Shirley, and that's it. Um, so let's move on. We, I said at the beginning we talk a, a greater length about Northern Ireland, so yeah. which I think one of the, probably most people now remember you for. If there's anything that you're sort of known for, it's some of the amazing programs you did about Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, tell tell us about some of the earlier programs that you made for Panorama, and and you know the the, the some of the connections you made and what it was like. Well. Um, I, I, the Northern Ireland conflict was was in some respects a um, you know a sort of un, an underground undercover uh, conflict. It was very very much intelligence led. Um, it was a classic counterinsurgency operation, and uh, it relied to a very considerable extent on uh, informers and agents. And as this became clear. Um, it also became clear that, that there was quite a lot of uh, collusion between <clears throat> the intelligence agencies and some of their agents. And I looked at that and, you know, I did a lot of programs about that. But the program that really mattered to me more than anything, I think, actually, was the uh, bombing of uh, OMA in August 1998, when uh, the real IRA uh, exploded a <clears throat> 500 pound sort of uh, car bomb in uh, the high street in, in August and killed 29 people and two babies, unborn babies, I should say. And um, the uh, police and uh, the Prime Minister then, Tony Blair, said no stone would be left unturned and all that. And two years on, there were still no arrests. Um, and we got various information from various sources. Uh, and to cut a long story short, we uh, found the four of the individuals who'd been involved in both planning and planting the bomb. Uh, well, not planting, actually, but leading lead there on the day, on the ground, assisting the planting of the bomb. And we found them and we confronted them. And this was 
quite a big story. Uh, all credit to the BBC. It was a huge risk because the, uh, you know, if we got it wrong, the BBC was in for several million pounds in defamation. We didn't get it wrong, which is good. And um, the really rewarding thing about that was, was that um, the Daily Mail followed this up with a fundraising campaign. They, they raised over a million pounds. When that ran out, then the Secretary of State, Peter Mandelson, uh, Northern Ireland Secretary of State, as he then was, um, followed up with, with public money and lawyers for the families got the case to court. It wasn't a criminal court, it was a civil court. And in the end, they got, um, uh, they got damages. So that was, you know, it was a good, good result. It's pretty astonishing uh, film to be, to be honest. Um, I should just add that there will be the opportunity for people to ask questions, and I, I think the address is a, an email, a, a web address. But it, I think that's at the bottom of the screen. That if you, um, there you go, it's just come up now. So do do send questions, and at the end I'll filter some of them through and and ask John. Um, so let's talk now about um, one area that you became particularly associated with uh, Panorama, which is um, Islamist extremism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you made a film about the MCB, the Muslim Council of Britain, but let's just go back a bit. What is it that first alerted you? I mean, this, even now, there's still people who deny that it's an issue. Um, uh, you were so far ahead of the game, as it were, in that. Um, what is it that first uh, brought you onto that topic? Well, I mean, honestly, only a blind man could see that after 9-11, um, a whole lot of um, sort of sleeping uh, elephants in the room, as it were, um, were awakened. And uh, there was a, one community, particularly the Muslim community, and I'm absolutely not treating it as one sort of monolithic community, because as we all know, the Muslim community in Britain is extremely diverse. So this does not, you know, what I'm about to say absolutely does not apply you know, to the Muslim community and most Muslims. But it was clear that, that Britain was a very active place for Islamist organizations. And that, um, that uh, we had a problem. We were, uh, there was a problem looming about um, meaningful integration. And uh, some of the values, some of the ideas which, had in, which, which informed, which, cre which helped exacerbate violent extremism were alive and well within certain organizations. And uh, essentially, uh, what I wanted to do was look at the organization that claimed to speak for uh, the Muslim community or Muslim communities in Britain, namely the Muslim Council of Britain after the 7-7 bombing. And because suicide bombing was the issue, um, from the point of view of, a print, of, of, of the principle of, of, of suicide bombings, I wanted to see how the MCB saw suicide bombing uh, in Israel as compared to the UK. And it was pretty clear that the, some of the MCB affiliates were, um, you know, were operating a double standard over that. And so we investigated the MCB. Um, and, uh, and it ended up with a sort of fairly long interview with the General Secretary, then Sir Iqbal Sukrani. We've got a clip uh, from the film. Do you want to introduce the clip to us and then we'll play it? Yes. Um, so this was, uh, I think it was called A Question of Leadership. And uh, we, we looked at uh, some of the affiliates of the Muslim Council of Britain uh, and um, the General Secretary then, who was or Secretary General, uh, General Secretary, I can't remember which now, uh, Sir Iqbal Sukrani did agree to an interview and I asked him um, if he was so, if he was opposed to suicide bombing in principle, that uh, why he had attended a memorial service for um, Ahmed Yassin, who was of course the uh, founder of Hamas. Um, and this was after, uh, this was 
towards the end of the Second Intifada, when, of course, Hamas had used uh, suicide bombings, bombers to uh, against uh, civilians in Israel. So, where exactly does the Muslim Council of Britain stand on Islamist groups that use suicide bombers against civilians, wherever they are? Last year, Sir Iqbal Sakrani paid his respects to the ideological chief of Hamas, the group responsible for dozens of suicide bombings targeted directly at Israeli civilians. An Israeli missile strike on Sheikh Yassin killed him in the street, his son, his bodyguards, and five civilians. After his funeral in Gaza, the Central Mosque in London arranged a memorial service for him. Sir Iqbal chose to attend, and the MCB hailed Sheikh Yassin as the renowned Islamic scholar. It's one thing supporting uh, the Palestinians, and it's another, isn't it, supporting the theological justification which Sheikh Yassin gave to the murder of civilians. He may have given Why? that. He may have given that. Well, there's no may mother. about it. He did. He it was did. the spiritual leader yes. and the ideological leader, spiritual founder and ideological leader of a terrorist movement. He, in, in your terms, if it means fighting occupation in the terrorist movement, uh, that is not a view that has been shared uh, by many people. Well, those who fight oppression, those who fight occupation, cannot be termed as terrorists. They are freedom fighters in the same way as Nelson Mandela fought against the apartheid, in the same way as Gandhi and many others fought the British rule in India. They are, they are people in different parts of the world who today, in terms of historical side of it, those who fought of which are now the real, the real leaders of, of, of the world. Do you think targeting Israeli civilians is terrorism? Targeting any innocent people in any part of the world, any part of it, is an act of terror. Whether it's carried out by individuals, whether it's group, carried out by groups, or whether it's carried out by states, all fits in the definition of terrorism. So if Hamas is targeting civilians in Israel, that's terrorism? Well, I, it? I've explained to you no, no. explicitly, hold on, whether it is Hamas, whether it's Israel, whether it's anybody else, any part of the world, we have no distinction. Why, why are you making such a difficult question? There's a simple answer to it. Loss of innocent civilian lives. We make no distinction between a life, between a life of a Palestinian or life of a, of a, of a, of a, of a Jew. Why? They're all part of the human race. So you the say, life is, there's a sacred, sacred sanctity in terms of life. So you say, in which case, why did you pay homage to a man who promoted the targeting of Israeli civilians? I've, it's a very I've, simple question. I've, I've given you a very simple, straight answer earlier on. And you just need to refer to my answer. Someone who fought against occupation, forced against subjugation... Using terrorism. Push, by your definition, the, the, using the, the, terrorism. If, if anybody, if they are, if they are uh, aiming at civilians in terms of uh, loss of life, then we don't accept that. We feel well, then why do go? Why why do you pay homage they, to him? They, they why, why just you 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 did not have to go to that memorial service in in the central mosque, did did, did, did you? You could have chosen not to go. Yeah. The point the point is, um, as a person and as a responsible person of an organization, an umbrella body, mm. that is affiliates across the country. Mm. We well, let them go. Hold on, hold on. Uh, whoever is organizing that, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to steer through issues that are very important in the community, issues that are, we are facing day in, day out from organizations. All right, but you've got a responsibility too, haven't you, to lead? Indeed. And set by example? Indeed. What signal does it send when the General Secretary, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, goes and pays homage to someone who supports suicide bombings in Israel? Well, you what kind, well, hang on, what kind of signal does that send to, to young Muslims in Britain? Yeah, if, if your whole question is based upon one aspect of that person's um, belief in terms of supporting it, we look into the wider picture. The suicide bombing that you're referring to is one aspect of the whole struggle. So these are, you know, these still remain incredibly pertinent and, and, and controversial 
areas still. And there's, there's lots of media organisations won't go near these kind of questions. Did, did you find in your career at the BBC that the BBC was you know, open to these kind of investigations or resistant or what kind of reception did you get when you rate when you'd raise these kind of issues? By and large, pretty good. Uh, it took a bit of work. You know, it wasn't easy. Um, it, 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 in the BBC, bless them, um, bless them, and I do bless them. It's always easier to. It tends to be easier to um, to get a commission against a, a right wing organisation than a sort of. Uh, I mean, that's very crude. But a sort of left uh, politic political organisations, but. Um, but fair play to the BBC. They once the ball was rolling, they were very supportive on on everything I've done. Um, they really were. And, you know, this I said you made a number of those films. What one other very well, uh, very important film that you made was on Interpol. Um, mm. And I wondered if you'd like to sort of just tell us some. Sure. Interpol is a, it remains a very controversial organisation. Sure. Um, well, well, yeah. Tell us something about the, the the background to the film you made and so on. Well, see, see it seemed to me that this whole question of values um, really turned on 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 you know how, how we felt about uh, Israel, the way the way the, the the what was happening in Israel and what was happening in the rest of the world because. Uh, you know, terrorism is terrorism. So, in a sense, uh, I kept trying to use Israel as a sort of benchmark. And the Interpol issue threw up a classic dilemma uh, of the kind which I don't think were an organisation in with, with similar circumstances in Britain, UK government would have tor tolerated, but mm. there we are. So the Interpol issue was the Interpol is a, is a is a Palestinian charity. It's based in London. Uh, it pro has provided um, tens of millions of pounds to charities in Gaza and the West Bank, and for sure, uh, its money goes to many good causes in both Gaza and the West Bank to the poor and dispossessed Palestinians. It's also a fact, certainly when I was looking at it that uh, a significant amount, if not the majority of their funds, went to uh, welfare organizations which were uh, under the control of Hamas and were regarded as being part of Hamas's welfare network. Now, uh, Interpol insisted that that did not amount to funding terrorism um, and uh, the UK government so far uh, agrees with them on that. Uh, the United States uh, doesn't think that that amounts to funding terrorism because the welfare network is part of Hamas's political wing uh, and or is, um, is, is part and parcel of the political movement um, and so it's a very live issue but as I say Interpol insists that uh, this is not funding terrorism. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that Interpol was buying weapons or anything of that sort, to be fair to them. Uh, but, but, but what we said in the programme uh, was um, uh, uh, the funds from Interpol had helped build Hamas up into the organisation it had become. And it was for others to decide uh, whether that did or didn't amount to funding terrorism. But as I say, Interpol are quite insistent that it doesn't. And the Charity Commission, uh, investigated all this. Um, uh, they didn't regard Interpol as having funded terrorism, but they did censure uh, Interpol for its um, failure to monitor, monitor some of its funding. And it also uh, ordered the uh, charity to sever its links from an organization called the Union of Good, which was run by Yusuf Karadara, which definitely did have links to Hamas. Okay, let's let's talk about something more upbeat uh, yes. to do with Israel. Um, one, I think maybe your last film for Panorama about uh, about the future of Israel um, and in the, in the sort of yeah. more modern world. Um, we'll, we, we've got a clip that we'll show from that film, but I just wanted to ask you. So, I think Annabelle mentioned at the beginning that that we nominated you for a, a Wheatso Commitment Award for mm -hmm. your commitment to, to Israel. The way you 
shown things. Um, and one of the, uh, I think, the prize for, for, for winning that award was a trip to Israel with to look at some of the Witso projects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I sort of think it ties in with one of the things in this film, which is more, I think mean, you say that you, um, in the film, that you get to show areas of Israel that don't often get covered in the in the media. Perhaps you could just expand on that a little. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been to Israel a lot of times and um, you know what it's like. The place sort of crackles with electricity and uh, there are lots of things that go on that never, never see the light of day, really. Um, and it's such an interesting place and it's got such a fascinating history that I wanted to capture some of those things that we never see. Um, uh, so, uh, and as it happened at the time, um, I think President Morsi had taken, was, uh, had been elected. Uh, so we had a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt. Uh, Jordan was um, having a real problem with the Muslim Brotherhood. And to the north, obviously, there was, the, there was a civil war breaking out. And, and uh, so in, in a sense, in 2012-13, Israel was surrounded by Islamist organizations and the question arose you know we were right in the heart of the Arab Spring how would Israel fare in those circumstances and so I persuaded the BBC to let me go to Israel and make a film about Israel facing the future and we've captured some of those moments there that you don't normally see and that absolutely is reinforced with Witzow's work I, I saw when I went to Israel with Witzow a whole range of projects um so you know we went to a fuller um um where there was a, a, a project uh, israelis were reaching out to israeli israeli arabs um we, we saw uh, a project in the negev helping bedouins this was absolutely cross community inclusive all of those aspirations i suppose that the original broadly secular Zionists envisaged in the Israel they wanted to create. So for me, it was the kind of Zionism that, um, you know, I bought into and it was good to see it in operation, in, in action. Cool. Uh, should we play the clip now? Right. Let's move on to what you're probably best known for at the moment, which is your most recent film on labor and anti-Semitism, which as I said at the beginning, was nominated last week for a BAFTA award. Um, just a reminder to uh, viewers that if you want to ask a question, just email or just, just use the web link uh, that's on your screen. Um, so some of us, you know, like the JC, for instance, we've been bashing away on this whole issue of labor and anti-Semitism since Jeremy Corbyn, where in fact, even before he became leader, we were following him. Mm. Um, and, you know, for, for two or three years, you get occasional sparks of interest from the, 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 the sort of national media, uh, and then it would all just disappear again. I think it's fair to say, I mean, after, it was the Ken Livingstone's story that really kicked it off and, and it didn't let up since, since then. But I think it's fair to say that your panorama film uh, really was, um, it, it just changed the entire debate on Labour and anti-Semitism because it became impossible for the party to deny what was going on once your film had come out. It was an incredibly controversial you, film. Let's go right back to the beginning. Um, when did you decide this is an area that I've simply just got to look at? And how was that? How did that go down at the BBC? Well, I've been trying to, uh, I, I mean, I could tell, I could, it was clear that there was a problem with uh, the arrival of Mr. Corbyn that, you know, views within uh, some sections of the left, which ordinarily would have been, you know, regarded as beyond the pale, were, uh, were being tolerated in a way that they hadn't been previously by previous Labour governments, and you could see that happening. Um, so it was obviously a story that needed sooner or later to be dealt with. The BBC were a bit resistant to begin with, not because they didn't believe in the subject, they just didn't, you know, these days you have to go with something new and important when you're a freelance. They won't attend because there isn't much money to invest in a punt, and they wanted something new. But eventually we did find something new, I did anyway, with a colleague. Um, the, there were seven former members of staff 
um, who had worked in the governance and legal unit handling anti-Semitism complaints. And their story was pretty consistent, which was essentially that the climate that had uh, prevailed uh, since particularly the 2016 leadership election was pretty hostile. And they found themselves looking over their shoulder, trying to second guess what the leadership would want um, because they'd had a few run-ins with them over a particular num over specific disciplinary cases. And it just became a mess, frankly, and uh, very stressful. And they decided with some de considerable degree of courage to tell their story, uh, to, to, to whistle blow, and the program was essentially built around them. So just tell us something about the actual mechanics of, of you know, you say we found these people. Mm. Um, how do you, as a journalist, how do you go about, you know, you've got a blank sheet of paper, you know there's something going on. How do you go about finding people and then persuading them to talk to you? I mean, after all, yeah, no, they've sure. spoken to anyone else before. So how do they, how do you get them to talk to you on camera? Well, you know, you hear something and... You know, you know, you know, you're in journalism too, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> you hear something, you follow it up, you chase it up. You, you know, someone says, "Yeah, I'll talk to you," and you get their trust, and they tell you they know someone else who had a similar experience, and so on. You, you, that's how it builds, and uh, that's how we did it. And then you, know, you make it sound quite easy. Well, um, it's not easy, but but it wasn't that actually. The, it, to be honest with you, there have you know, been much harder stories. There haven't been that many stories with as with a with as long a tail as this. I mean, this, you know, Ken Loach is threatening to demonstrate outside BAFTA. I think, um, uh, you know, this goes on. I mean, just last Friday, I mean, there was just a, a, a Twitter storm. Uh, well, a Twitter storm, a Twitter pylon, uh, with um, you know, frankly, abuse uh, because we. BAFTA had had the temerity to uh, to shortlist this as a program, so it still goes on. It's it's pretty toxic. But the reaction, I mean, in yeah. some ways, the reaction to the film was, I mean, it's not that it's slightly glib to say this because it's not true. But the reaction to the film was more interesting than the film itself. Um, actually, the film was incredibly important. Um, but the, the 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 sheer toxicity of the reaction to it, I think, told you know at the time, told a very big story about the way that that kind of Corbynite mindset how, how did it feel to be on the receiving end of I mean you were traduced in a way that you know most journalists actually for all the hostility to journalists never actually have to suffer and it was it, it remains unrelenting how, how does it actually feel well I mean every time I every pretty much every time I've made a program about extremism uh, and to some extent, there's a similar experience in Northern Ireland. You get it from one side or the other. Um, but this is particularly sort of febrile, um, this stuff. And, um, you know, it's very personal. I mean, I was called a proven liar on uh, Friday uh, and a ghoul. And anyway, I don't want to, you know, look, it, it goes with the territory. But it, um, the temptation to respond is is quite strong but of course it's a it's you know it's a rabbit hole that that if you if you go down there you'll be there forever so i don't bother except in the courts um, and, and where do you think uh i mean you're you're a reporter rather than a rather than a predictor as it were but where no. where do you think the story is going to go now that keir starmer is leader do you do you think he's sincere in his wish to to deal with anti-semitism do you think, think he's so. able to deal with Look, it? I, 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 who knows? I mean, we'll have to see. But I, I think so. I think so. I think uh, so far he's made all the right noises. Uh, look, it's it, you know, let's be clear. You can get all you can get the disciplinary process working like clockwork, and I think it has improved. To be fair, to the uh, sort of fag end of the Corbyn administration, I think they clearly have made. They do appear to have made some very significant. Uh, improvements it's taken a long time but they, they they are getting through these cases it would appear look um that isn't really that that's obviously good the real change though is the cultural change 
the lead the, the leader of the Labour Party needs to explain to the membership that because so much of this is is you know it revolves around the Israel-Palestine conflict of which there is a lot of you know a lot of uh, uh, you know strong feelings that the Labour Party the left has to find for some of them anyway a new way of debating this conflict you you know you 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 can you can be very very critical of the israelis you can say there if you want to you can you, you you know you can say bad things about them but what you can't do there are certain things you can't do uh which the left felt free to do you know lord rothschild's got nothing to do with it um you know analogies to the holocaust or nazis i think are grotesque um, and so on. You, 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 so the next leader, the, well, Starmer, who, he'll be judged, I think, by whatever cultural change he manages to bring about the way this conflict is, is, is debated, um, because that is the nature of contemporary anti-Semitism. This is leached into the conflict, and, uh, and it's become very unpleasant and toxic, and it's made an awful lot of Jewish members of the Labour Party who are absolutely, uh, you know, committed to Palestinian rights. It's just made them feel really, really uncomfortable. And um, so the leader needs to change the culture. That'll be the big test. Not whether there's a decent disciplinary system, although that's important. Yeah. Um, I agree with that completely, by the way. Um, Okay, let's let's uh, draw this bit of the evening to a close by asking. I just want to talk about one non-work related aspect. There's okay. there's the, there's a your your hobby, which I think uh, will uh, astound quite a few people. Um, right. What what what? Tell us something about. I won't give the surprise away. Tell us something about what you what you your, your, about your passion. My passion. Well, my passion. Um, Stephen, uh, apart from journalism, uh, is a rich man's passion. I, before I got married, had children and spent all my money on them and everything else. I used to have a share in an aeroplane, actually. Um, I became absolutely addicted to um, aerobatics, funnily enough. And I spent all my money on this old, uh, uh, I think it was probably 1940-something, I can't remember, late 40s. Sorry. It did have a chipmunk, which I used to fly. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it came to a sticky end. It had an engine failure, and I had to land on Chorley Golf Course, which was a triumph because I survived. Um, but flying was my big passion, and uh, I've obviously had to give it up. I've, I've lost, you know, I'm out of hours on my license. But my wife very kindly occasionally gets me a trip up, uh, and it all comes back. It's like riding a bicycle. And um, the BBC, I managed, to, I was making a program about transport and the environment and air travel and um, managed to use um, aerobatics to introduce the perils of uh, uh, the environmental uh, damage that flying is doing. And I had a wonderful day and they filmed that. I think we have, uh, I think we have a clip of that. Uh, yeah. Of that. That bit, as it were. Do you want to play the clip now? And you have control. Okay, I have control. I'm power rolling to the left, okay? Absolutely right. Pose up. I love flying, but I never thought it would become such a political issue. There you go. It's effortless, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. I love it. We may all have to clip our wings soon. Let me show you what I mean. We're about to perform a maneuver called the stall turn. We're pulling the airplane up into a near vertical climb. And at the top of this climb, we just literally cartwheel the airplane over. So it's kind of suspended in midair. Forces of gravity and propulsion balancing each other out. Then gravity takes over. And down we go into what could be a graveyard spiral. We need to pull out of. Climate change is like the stall turn. We're hurtling towards what scientists call the tipping point. When the natural balance between the atmosphere and the Earth fall out of kilter. Fortunately, uh, 
um, I know how to pull out of this one. But do we know how to pull ourselves up from climate change disaster? Flying is pumping out more and more carbon into the air just when we're all supposed to be stopping climate change from spinning out of control. Oh, get me back in that airplane. <laughs> Wonderful. I think having the Wagner on as the soundtrack was um, was a master stroke. Um, right, we've we've uh, I've got some questions from the audience now, which I'm yeah. going to try and sift through. Um, let's kick off with this is quite an interesting one. Um, when have you felt most in danger as a reporter? Uh, well, I, I, a few times, I've felt in danger a few times, but I, you know, really, I wouldn't want to exaggerate. Nothing really heroic. Um, Nothing heroic. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. What uh, film or what journalism that you've done are you are you most proud of? Mm. That is a really good question. Um, well, I I suppose the Oma film actually. You know, because that was a blow for justice. Uh, Twenty nine people lost friends and family and um well family and friends lost 29 people i should say and um for various complicated reasons the criminal justice system couldn't deal with it and talking to these victims of terrorism uh oh. was it was really heartbreaking i mean it was really really heartbreaking i remember one of the one guy who lost his wife he 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 you know, he described how when he, you know, he he realized his wife had been killed. He'd, he'd been looking, he'd gone to all the hospitals looking for her and uh, no, you know, until he finds the hospital where she's, you know, she's in the mortuary. And he s describes going home and said, you know, all you could hear was the ticking of the clock. Um, and there were lots of really heartbreaking stories like that. And that spoke for victims of terrorism everywhere i've always felt very strongly about terrorism i hate it and uh hate it and um so it was terrific to be able to help some victims of terrorism uh get justice in a court uh, that made me feel good it's um it's just dawned on me really when you say you hate terrorism that it's there's a sort of thread that runs through so many of the areas you've looked at, whether it's, I mean, you know, the Third Reich wasn't terrorist, but it was a former state terror. Um, yeah. There's uh, Northern Ireland, there's the Labour anti-Semitism is people who are sympathetic to terrorists. It's a real thread through your work, isn't it? Well, I suppose I hadn't thought of it like that, actually, Stephen. I, you're right. Um, I just think uh, targeting someone who isn't in uniform is, a, is just an abomination. I, I just do, I, I just, makes me really angry, you know. And anybody who, and anybody who equivocates, frankly, about it, you know, that was the, that was the point, that was the point that I was really trying to get to with Sakrani. Now, you know, he's, he said, I mean, it was pretty obvious. You know, he, he said, well, of course, we're opposed to uh, civilians being targeted. Fine. I, I'm sure he, he probably, I'm not disputing that. But if that's such a principle, why would you, why would you go to a service to commemorate someone whose principal weapon against their adversary was to use human bombs against kids in discotheques? I mean, it, it, it's unconscionable and for me it's just double talk and mm. i you know as and i always you know what i say about journalism is that it's a blunt instrument and it's a it's a kind of bullshit detector that's what we do you know yeah but well, so that's a very that that ties in with the next question that we've had in which which i wanted to ask which is the current erosion of that threatens journalism, especially fake news on social media. Yeah. 
Yeah, look, it's a real problem. And uh, the solution is not easy, but I but one one solution clearly is to keep the mainstream networks funded and you know alive and 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 in good health because because whatever people may think of the bbc and i know there are very strong views about the bbc's coverage in the middle east which i happen to think is is pretty good these days and has been for some time uh but you know you you pretty much can rely pretty much can rely on 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 mainstream broadcasters i'm including itv you know channel four bbc and all because because we do operate they do operate to a set of standards. You know, there are guidelines. Of course, they're broken mm. at times, but there are fundamental guidelines that they have to stick to. And, you know, social media is utterly unmediated and, it, and it's a bear pit and, and it threatens to, uh, you know, emasculate mainstream reliable news. And it's a real worry. It really worries me. Um, I think we've got, we've got time for one more question, which is, uh, this is a, <laughs> I don't know how to think of this question. What, what future do you see for Jews in Britain? A pretty good future. Look, uh, gosh, um, look, the, the, the story of Jewish, um, the, you know, you started this by asking me what, what, why was I so, you know, what attracted me to Israel and all that. The whole story of um, the whole history of, of um, Jewish, uh, you know, resilience, uh, endurance, tenacity, creativity, intelligence, grit, determination, and all of that is a very inspiring story. Um, and um, and look, look at look at what happened. Look at look at look at the trend. Look at look at what's happened in the last hundred years with the Jewish community in Britain. It's a model. It's a brilliant story of absolutely, you know, of of totally credible, meaningful integration, whereby you know culture has been maintained in many houses within the four walls, and when put it crudely when, when British Jews leave their front door they 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 merge effortlessly into the mainstream they are part of the mainstream they toast the queen before the president of Israel and all that it's a great story of integration it's a great success story in every way and it's a model and that's how it's always going to be I think I think in that sense you know yeah it is a light to nations. And I think um, if I can finish using my position as, as interviewer, um, yeah. one of the things that I often say, I mean, I've spent, you know, the whole time of Corbyn looking at some of the most, you know, disgusting elements of Jew hate and so on. And it's sometimes you sometimes let it get on top of you. And mm. one of the things I, I keep saying to my team and that I keep saying whenever I give talks is, you know, yes, anti-Semitism was on the rise. Yes, Labour has this terrible problem and so on. But you have to remember that there's probably no time, no place in history on Earth where it's ever been a better time or place, a safer time or place to be a Jew than today in Britain. There's really, you know, maybe in the States, but apart from that, there's nowhere else on Earth that where it's safer Look, to be you know you have to remember that for all the for all the terribleness and all the the growth in anti-semitism we always have to keep it in perspective anyway I'm, that's an abuse of my position in this interview but it's something i feel very strongly about well i'm glad you do because i i agree with that and and i think look i think you know the last four or five years within the labor party um i think that story cut through i think for for a while it was contained within westminster I think you guys were seminal to this story breaking out of Westminster and into the kind of, you know, wider bloodstream of British politics. And I think people looked and they didn't like it. I really do think that. And I don't think we're going to see that again. 
as I say, I think the Labour Party needs to really focus on how they debate the Israel-Palestine conflict. And um, my goodness me, if, if annexation does happen, that's going to be a problem. Uh, but we need to ensure that this debate is conducted within a civilized, robust framework. And that is critically the job of the next Labour Party leader. If we do that, then I think the I think anti-Semitism in this country will retreat uh, to where it was. Unfortunately, it's a, you know, it's a bit like COVID. It's a damn virus that you can never quite kill off. And I honestly don't understand. I mean, this is the other thing. I just don't, you know, I don't understand why you can't ever kill it. Uh, but we can at least put it back to where it was. And I think it will happen. So absolutely, it's a, there's no, no need to leave. Not That's a relatively upbeat note on which to uh, on which to end our conversation. For sure, for sure. Uh, John, however, the, the, the thing I always have whenever I talk about anything with you is, however sordid the topics of conversation may be, I always feel enriched uh, after having spoken to you. And I hope our viewers uh, feel the same way. I think it's been a fascinating uh, hour or so. Uh, so thank you very much for sparing the time. And, and, just, and I'll hand back to you now, Annabelle. I'd like to thank Stephen and John so much for a wonderful, informative and engaging evening. It's been such a pleasure to eavesdrop on your conversation. WITSO hopes to enjoy a continuing collaboration with you both and to welcoming you and any of our viewers to see the remarkable work of the various WITSO projects when you next come to Israel. Finally, I'd like to remind you of the opportunity to donate to the Barzillai Medical Daycare Centre by visiting our website, wheatsouk.org forward slash donate. And to remind you of our next virtual event, which is on the 11th of June at 6.45, Opera and the Silver Screen. You can book for this event at wheatsouk.org forward slash events. For now though, good night.